Good afternoon. It's just after one o'clock. It's Monday, the 1st of December 2014. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish. With me in the studio, Mike Robinson, just checking. And uh, behind the IT desk is Nick Green. Uh, well, the weather across the country is variable. I think uh, Norfolk is under a thick la layer of cloud. Um, Wales has got a bit of sunshine, apparently. It's sunny here in Plymouth and uh, similar across the rest of the country. So variable. Mm. Uh, much like the politics, um, we, we've got a theme really for today's uh, news, which is that uh, while people are distracted on other things, Black, Black Friday, the uh, approach of Christmas, international politics, uh, Britain is being dismantled by the Lib Lab Com. So let's have a look at what's happening starting overseas. Uh, yes, uh, this is Donald Tusk, um, who is now the uh, president of the of Europe, in fact, president of Europe. Our president. Then, our our right. president, yes. Yeah. Um, so he's president of the European Council, sometimes referred to as the president of the European Union, and that's as opposed to Jean-Claude Juncker, who is president of the European Commission, uh, because goodness knows any newly formed uh, nation state like the EU needs at least two presidents. Uh, well, much the same with Britain, isn't it? We've really got two prime ministers. Yeah. It's so, tr traditional. So anyway, apparently, uh, apparently, all Polish people are proud that Tusk is the new president of Europe, uh, except for the ones I speak to, obviously. But but this is the chief economist, economist at Demos here, Jonathan Todd, uh, who says that, uh, that all Polish people are delighted. Um, now, it has to be said, it is a bit strange. Uh, Donald doesn't seem like a terribly Polish name, does it? No. Well, it, it appears his grandmother dallied with uh, a lord, a Scottish lord, uh, and, uh, and that produced his father. Um, and that's his father was called Donald, and that's why he's called Donald. Right, right. I'm probably going to be shot here because duck came into my work, into my mind as as you gave the Donald bit. But yes, it indeed. Was well, well, anyway, so he's president of, president of Europe. But where's he come from? Well, he's been Prime Minister of Poland from 2007 until earlier this year, uh, and of course he was elected Prime Minister and installed in that job by uh, uh, Lech. Uh, sorry, Lech Kaczynski, um, and uh, of course they absolutely despised each other uh, and went up against each other in many, many issues. Uh, and Tusk, uh, a great uh, constitutional reformer in Poland, uh, attempting to, to deal with the constitution in order to restrict the powers of the president. Um, and of course he will find uh, that he's friends with Cameron on, the, on that basis. Uh, they are absolutely, or he is absolutely friends with uh, Obama and Cameron and Merkel. Uh, and, uh, and this is particularly in recent years, sucking up to Obama and NATO. Uh, he began uh, as prime minister by working with Putin and making some agreements with Putin. But obviously in recent years, he's changed 180 degrees with respect to Putin uh, because uh, he wants to suck up to these guys. Uh, and... Uh, it's that willingness uh, to toe that party line, which has uh, got him the job uh, as president of the EU, no doubt. Uh, now, of course, uh, Kaczynski, the Polish president at the time, uh, who inaugurated him as prime minister, uh, died in the Smolensk uh, plane crash. And, uh, of course, the, the uh, mainstream media-led conspiracy theories around, around this uh, plane crash implied that uh, it was Putin had shot the plane down, almost as if he had pulled the trigger himself. But interestingly enough, and you know, I don't want to appear to be a conspiracy theorist here, uh, Brian, but interestingly enough, uh, Tusk was supposed to be on this plane, but for some reason, just by coincidence, uh, made alternative arrangements um, and wasn't on the plane at the end of the day. So that'll just be a coincidence. Yes. The, the plane that gets, um, well, falls out the sky with, with all of these... Uh, with half the, the Polish government on it, yes. Right, so he just decides not to get on that plane. Yep. Well, very lucky man. Very lucky. Yeah. Okay, moving on then, uh, more slightly more serious issues. Uh, Russia has is uh, preparing for um, this whole NATO situation, this NATO uh, encroachment on its borders. Uh, we've been talking about this for a very long time. Uh, but to everybody's surprise, because nobody was really uh, expecting it, uh, Russia fired a nuclear missile, test fired a nuclear missile uh, on Friday. Uh, obviously, no no warhead on it, of course, um, but it landed where it was supposed to land, and that was all very well. And of course, the, a lot of the mainstream media today pushing the idea that uh, 
uh, Russia is spending five hundred million dollars, five hundred billion dollars. Sorry, uh, refurbishing its uh, its uh, um, military train operations, yeah. uh, and they're going for uh, refurbishing the train launched uh, nuclear missiles. Now, you said you were familiar with these. Well, uh, at the time, they sort of we're going back to Cold War period now, uh, high to the Cold War mm. when. Um, this was seen as being a particularly effective way of moving um, serious um, nuclear missile equipment around the country very quickly. So one minute is in one place and in a few hours it's moved 100 miles or 200 miles. So to see this refurbished, I think, is, is showing uh, Putin's attempt um, intent not to be bullied indeed, basically indeed now the, the missile that was fired on friday was fired from a nuclear submarine um, and the russian navy is expecting to have uh, eight uh, new nuclear submarines delivered now of course they may have a bit more money for that um, because uh, the french have decided not to deliver the ships that they were building for the russians um, and yeah. the only people that are getting hurt by that of course are the french I would imagine so. Yes. Since, um, yeah, they've got problems with shipbuilding like uh, all of the rest of well, Western nations. This is, this is the, the, Germans, the of rationality course. of, the, uh, of the, um, uh, the, the economic sanctions on Russia, of course, because the only people who actually get hurt by that is the people that are imposing the sanctions. Um, but in the meantime, then, Hong Kong, uh, the coloured revolution has uh, got another lease of life and they've, they've uh, been out uh, protesting again. Uh, more clashes with police, as you would imagine, um, but uh, the the Hong Kong authorities saying that uh, in fact uh, the police have been pretty uh, have been holding back. They haven't been driving over they've anybody in tanks and so on. So restrained. They've been restrained, uh, and uh, they're really suggesting that the students don't come out uh, again in in a hurry. But of course they will. Uh, but the bit that uh, I found quite amusing uh, was that the Chinese have refused to allow. Uh, a British delegation, this is the uh, the, the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, uh, will not be allowed to enter Hong Kong. And uh, it, it's just interesting that these people were heading over there at this particular time, uh, just when tensions are um, pretty high. Um, I believe that they were going over there, of course, to set, calm things down and make sure everything, um, nothing, no incitement involved. Yeah. It, it is fascinating, this, Mike, because, of course, we've got David Cameron awarding these huge strategic infrastructure pro projects to the Chinese, um, China with an appalling human rights record. Uh, we've then got British MPs popping over to Hong Kong, yeah, just to help calm it down, uh, or maybe not. Uh, but now we've got China banning British MPs, the same MPs who are giving them contracts for large infrastructure. It's all turbulent, it's all confused, it's all difficult to pin down what's going on. Yes, but underlying of this, of course, is, is this whole tension between uh, the World Bank IMF on one hand and the BRICS on the other. And of course, what, what Britain, America and the European Union, the IMF, the World Bank and this faction want is to see regime change in both Russia and China. Yeah. And so that's what this uh, coloured revolution in Hong Kong is all about. They're hoping that this pro-democracy in inverted commas because of course we don't live in a democracy and we don't promote democracy anywhere. Uh, this pro-democracy demonstration they're hoping will extend beyond Hong Kong into other Chinese cities and that's what they're aiming for. It is a coloured revolution and regime change at the end of the day is what they're hoping for. I think so and uh, while people are watching maybe what's going on in Hong Kong of course they're not watching what is slowly but surely taking place in the UK. Um, as uh, we often say, the news seems to come to us rather than us going looking for things. And uh, this was uh, provided to us over the last couple of days um, from Political Scrapbook. Uh, now, this is seemingly quite a small story. Cameron's office gave £150,000 to a failing charity run by a party donor. Uh, are we interested in the donor? Possibly, but um, we're going to come in at a slightly different angle. Um, so what is this about here? Well, basically, um, uh, the Cabinet Office had already given uh, £350,000 in public funding uh, to this charity, the Big Society Network, chaired by the Tory donor, Martin Rose. Um, but all of a sudden, the charity, it's realised that it was underperforming. Uh, well, basically, um, a warning was put out that it would not be appropriate to grant fund an organisation 
that's in financial difficulty or that's struggling uh, to appropriately manage its financial affairs. So that was the warning uh, given back to the Prime Minister's office um, as a result of which David Cameron's office awarded the organisation another £181,000. So we say what's going on here? Uh, public money coming directly from David Cameron's hand into a charity set up by a donor um, that is in financial difficulty. So that's one view of what's going on here. Uh, well, this is another report um, from civil society. It's saying that number 10 told Heard uh, to keep funding Big Society Network despite its poor performance. And if you go and have a read of this article, which we'd encourage you to do, uh, the line is that um, it's really incompetence, that here was a failing charity. Uh, they were pushing in money, uh, but it wasn't doing the business. Well, how much money was going in? Uh, quite a lot. Uh, there was a £480,000 input. There was a £830,000 input, um, £350,299. Lots of money all being pushed into a charity called the Big Society Network. Uh, what was this for? Well, let's have a little look uh, because um, a key name comes out of this, a gentleman called Steve Moore. Uh, but first of all, let's have a look at what he said this uh, charity was about. He said there are three angles uh, to big society. It is a political message and it is about giving power to the people. It is therefore naturally contested. And because this came from a conference, Steve's happy to discuss this later. Uh, well, he goes on to say it's influencing government policies. It's linked to welfare reform, government reform, educational reform. Policies are emerging from it. Policies that we are not used to. And removing barriers through legislation. That's an interesting statement. Mm. Removing barriers through legislation is an overarching theme Behind it, free schools, community society, big society bank, national citizenship. So remember, this is all part of the charity that uh, Cameron was desperate to keep alive. And then point three here, the big society network is a startup business with the aim of delivering the big society concept from outside the government. So they're saying it's political. Uh, but you're going to deliver that politics from outside government, acting outside authority, created by a small group of people. It does not rely on government funding. It stands alone from the government, almost as a separate entity. Almost. Well, almost. So I just wanted to add in here, it stands alone from the government. This is what Steve Moore had to say, except, of course, where it's being directly fed by government money. So... The desperation for David Cameron to fund this charity is not because it's a charity. It's because, as uh, Steve Moore tells us here, this is actually a vehicle for getting political ad uh, agenda into society, essentially without us seeing it. Uh, well, um, let's just also remind ourselves of that first statement. It is a political message. Mm. It is political. Well, who's Steve Moore? Well, who is he? Um, this is the man. Uh, he gets a mention in the Third Sector magazine uh, because what else is he up to? Uh, well, he's working to bring attention to our Magna Carta. Um, now, I know um, things are happening at the moment, Mike, aren't they, with regard to um, uh, the government asking questions well, about it's our just constitution. Amazing. It's just amazing how many NGOs and, and foundations are coming out uh, promoting Magna Carta at the mm. same time as saying, well, actually, Magna Carta hasn't been written down anywhere, so we need to have a written constitution instead. Um, so they're saying on one hand, 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, we've got to promote that, but we've got to promote it by getting rid of it. Um, and uh, he, he's obviously involved in the Magna Carta Foundation, uh, and uh, they are one of the organisations, along with the British Secular Society and various others, um, who want to remove uh, um, our common law-based constitution and replace it with something uh, a lot more dictatorial. Yeah. So, Nick, if we can just bring the gentleman back on screen, the question or questions we need to ask is, who is this man? I mean, where has this man come from and uh, who gave him authority to drive change of our constitution? 
Uh, well, we get some clues again from civil society here. This is uh, their page where they're talking about Steve Moore, chief executive of the Big Society Network. And what is his background? Well, he's a filmmaker. He's worked in Australia. Um, he's been involved with Thames Gateway, Deptford and Brixton City Challenges. And then if we have a look down, he's uh, been director of Solo Tech and the Learning and Skills Council. He's been employed as an advisor to Microsoft, the Royal Society, the Arts, the BBC, uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, Department for Education and Skills, Enterprise UK, Nesta, and Unlimited. Um, so he's a conference organiser, or is he? Uh, if you say to yourself, what actually are the attributes of this man to do anything, it's not clear. Um, but it gets more interesting because uh, if we have a look at this, designing for civil society, uh, it's telling us that basically the uh, new UK initiative for web-enabled social innovation starts in the pub. And uh, so there was a meeting that took place back in 2007 uh, where they, these individuals, we're going to say totally unelected individuals, are discussing how society can be changed by using uh, social networks. Here's Steve Moore. And um, there's also a gentleman of interest, as we'll see, called Nick Booth. So people have a meeting in a pub and the next minute they've got huge government funding. And what are they doing? Implementing government agenda behind our backs. So um, Mr. Booth involved in social media surgery. Uh, which it says it's here to make it easier to find and run social media. And uh, he's also involved with this one, Podnosh. And what does he say they're doing? Uh, well, it's pretty simple. We want to change the way the public and the public sector talk to each other. And there's a picture of Nick Booth. Nice colours there. Yep. Um, common purpose Common colours. purpose colours. Yeah. And Podnosh is run and owned by Nick Booth, a former BBC political reporter and television um, and radio documentary maker. So suddenly we've got these unknown quasi-media people working in the background with vast amounts of public money in order to tell us that they're going to change our society. Mm -hmm. um, subversion, uh, Saul Alinsky, Marxism, communitarians, you can call it what you like, uh, but essentially we've got a subversive movement being funded directly from uh, David Cameron's central office. At that point, I pause. <laughs> well, um, let's see how this works in practice. So we're going to say thank you very much to, uh, to a local Plymouth person who sent this in to us. Um, headline from the Herald, Plymouth Herald, and it says councils win £700,000 from government to incite new ways of working and uh, this is the meat of it the two councils South Hams District and West Devon Borough Council have won money uh, through the Transformation Challenge Award organised by a network which supports public sector reform. Um, now I just want to say I couldn't help notice that on the Herald uh, page what sort of thing are they promoting what are they putting in your uh, mind as you read this article. Well, this is what they had on the uh, side page. I'll leave you to look at it, but it's pretty gruesome. Um, well done, Plymouth Herald, for um, subjecting the general public to pretty unpleasant visual images. So back on the transformation, where, what are they talking about? Well, they just happen to be talking about this, the Transformation Challenge Award and Capital Receipt Flexibility 2014 to 2016. And what's going on here is as the government is uh, cutting money to local authorities with one hand, it's encouraging them to take the same sort of money uh, via um, these quasi-public charities that are all working for transformation. So this is the document, and it's come out of the Department for Communities and Local Government. And who's been promoting it? Well, it's this gentleman, Brandon Lewis. Um, and let's have a look at what he says. Public services should work for the people who rely on them. Too often people get passed from pillar to post 
rather than having their problems solved first time round. And so what it's saying is that we are going to give local authorities the opportunity to lead the transformation of their services. Well, have a look at this in the latter part of the text um, because he's talking about funding. He says, we, the government, have set up Transformation Challenge Award. And then suddenly there's 320 million available in the next two years. So there's no money, austerity measures, except where you're going to transform local councils when we've got 320 million available. Interesting, that's the same figure used for Objective 1 in Cornwall, which was spent in a matter of years with no uh, full and complete audited accounts. So what sort of councils are we going to get? Well, here we are, business re-engineering. We want to see councils re-engineer their business processes through sharing all or some of their corporate services, workforces, information technology systems and assets. So they're becoming a business and uh, we're going to have service redesign on the success of community budget pilots. So via the back door, we're now seeing the communitarian mm. British system coming through the Lib Lab Con. This is where they're taking um, government and it's being done essentially um, in front of our eyes when we know how to look for it. Here's the man himself, Brandon Lewis. And surprise, surprise, he's trained as a uh, QC, so another legal man. And this is the man helping slide in this new, I'm going to say, Marxist agenda, uh, the transformation process. Mm. Pretty incredible, isn't it? Silence. silence. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, while we were doing the research on this, we couldn't help but remind ourselves of the fact, of course, it was the UK column that pointed out the fraud and corruption um, around um, Francis Maud's office and, of course, David Cameron's office as well, uh, was related to common purpose. And here we've got uh, one of the original documents that we printed showing that um, the Cabinet Office deliberately altered the minutes of a meeting uh, to prevent the public knowing that there had been insider dealing over a common purpose contract. So the key bit was here, uh, where basically they originally said that running workshops for the top 200 civil servants under the common purpose model uh, was proposed. And um, uh, the, committee meet, uh, the committee members agreed to consider the costs. Uh, so that's what the public was told first time round. That was actually a lie uh, because what had really happened was that Helen Ghosh had proposed running um, a number of workshops for the, uh, for the top 200 under the common purpose model. And then Helen Ghosh herself and David Bell, who just happened to be the um, uh, chairman of common purpose, uh, agree to consider the cost. So there was blatant insider dealing. And of course, this was covered up uh, by the cab Cabinet Office uh, deliberately to deceive the public. Perhaps they didn't want people to know that David Bell was taking part in these kind of high level Cabinet Office meetings. Oh, I'm sure that's absolutely the case. And of course, this is the same David Bell that was working flat out with uh, Leveson to get control of the press. So you've got fraud and corruption with one hand get control of the press, uh, well, nobody can report what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say on the 1st of December 2014, we're going to uh, give UK Column a well done because we've consistently been highlighting what's going on. And we just bring you back to uh, what we, we pushed out in uh, 2013, where we warned about the subversion of Cameron's big society networks. Uh, we drew a diagram showing how all of the money was circulating. And of course, Eric Pickles right in the middle of it. Uh, but on the bottom of that page it should come up here. Uh, we were actually talking about the Big Society Network uh, claiming to be an independent charity. Uh, we pointed out it was getting money from the Cabinet Office. But look who the other funders are. Nesta, Nominet Trust, Big Lottery, Gilbenkian Foundation, Clydesdale Bank, Cabinet Office, Deloitte, um, SIB, Vodafone, Cooperative, Indiegogo. 
And who are the trustees? Well, they just happen to include uh, Giles Gibbons, um, who's part of the Serco Foundation. Mm. So we've got a mix of, um, of the quasi charity with big business in Serco. I'll just finish that off if I may, Nick, sorry, one, one to go. And uh, this was the other part of it, uh, whether we had a diagram about the network itself. So um, what sort of things were they talking about? Uh, well, they're talking about an army of community organisers. Uh, they're talking about applied behavioural psychology. And uh, they're also talking about another organisation called COCO. Mm. Where's it coming from? Follow all this through. It's coming straight out of the, um, uh, the UN. If you just put that one back on screen, Nick. Thank you. Um, so... An excellent article written in that uh, 2013 UK column edition. Um, it was warning that the whole cooperative, quasi-cooperative movement was coming directly out of the UN. And I'm going to end on this bit, uh, really, which is um, if you don't believe that uh, the applied behavioural psychology is real, uh, this is South Wales, where a local councillor is boasting that they've been using nudging to create permanent behavioural change and to change the mindset of youngsters. Now, of course, this is being promoted here as a good thing because they were stopping the youngsters setting fire to uh, uh, grass areas. But nevertheless, here is an example of the, of the applied behavioural psychology. So um, we just recap. Um, the paper's all talking about the fact that big society is in tatters. No, it's not. Um, here's the Guardian Big Society Network under investigation. Uh, National Audit Office pointing out fraud and corruption going on. Uh, Third Sector magazine pointing it out. Uh, what we say is you can trust uh, Cameron's Tories to promote fraud and corruption. So UK Column says, vote, vote Tory. Tory 2015. Yeah. <laughs> you know it makes sense. Yeah. Do we but, need to say that sarcasm? We do, because somebody may possibly think the UK column has now turned Tory. <laughs> uh, we haven't, but we're going to say, if you want more of the same, fraud, corruption, lies, wars overseas, people who can't feed themselves, just get out there and vote David Cameron, vote Tory 2015. Easy. Yeah, because there's no corruption here with Stephen Dorrell. None at all. That's good. That's good, yes. So Stephen Dorrell has, has a new job. Um, he's, uh, well, actually, KPMG will not tell us how much they're going to pay him for this job, but it's understood to be six figures for three days a week uh, on a pro rata basis. Uh, now, of course, he is uh, MP for Charnwood at the moment. Uh, he sat in John Major's government. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he is now helping KPMG uh, tender for a £1 billion deal to manage patient medical records. So there's no insider sort of dealing sort of thing going on here at all. No conflict of interest. Of course, he's paid £67,000 a year at the moment for being an MP. Um, plus, he claimed uh, £129,673.32 in expenses in 2013-14. Uh, and he also receives a fee of £10,000 as a director of management services firm Faithful. I guess that's a non-executive director. But anyway... Uh, he's going to work three days a week for K KPMG in its healthcare and public sector practice. Um, now, it has to be said, there have been a few by-elections recently because obviously people have decided to change their jobs in, uh, in the sense that they moved from being a Tory party member to being a UKIP member and they thought that the honest thing to do under those circumstances was to resign their seat and put themselves up for re-election. But here's a guy who has paid £67,000 a year, you would think, for five days' work. Uh, but in fact, he's going to work for the next six months, three days a week for KPMG. So as you do. As you do. So yeah. what kind of service? Uh, uh, this is called moonlighting, is it not? And it's, it's most employment contracts don't permit that sort of thing. Well, you've got everything there. We might have moonlighting. We've got um, um, it's not in the public interest. We've got its conflict of interest with uh, big business, particularly powerful companies. Yeah. Uh, but... This seems to follow the pattern now with David Cameron's Conservatives, which is fraud, corruption. Uh, Brooks Newmark, take your clothes off and flash yourself 
that doesn't matter. You can still be an MP, even though you're there naked uh, next to your toilet, or you can be in your underwear, uh, Chris Bryant, Labour MP. It doesn't really matter what you do as an MP. Or, or George Osborne, who was pretty, seemed to be pretty high in Westminster in that uh, We may video. be coming on to that. Okay, that's fine. Um, total corruption and arrogance, of course. These people now say they're ruling us completely. We need to get rid of them, I think. Mm. Um, well, let's remind ourselves when we talk about David Cameron, who do we really mean? Um, we had this article back in 2013 where the mainstream press had pointed out that when showing uh, some MPs around his house um, in Downing Street, um, David Cameron had been joking uh, that he'd been invading a number of countries and uh, he said he'd done Libya. Uh, where, should he, where should he invade next? Uh, good public schoolboy joke, of course. Meanwhile, millions of people dying. Uh, but we just come up with this. This is serious. The spectator saying, well, actually, David Cameron can uh, link him back, himself back to Catherine the Great. And according to the article, they say, just have a look at the pictures. He even looks a bit like her. And um, of course, the Daily Mail was saying that uh, David Cameron may be directly descended from Moses. And that was as a result of um, genealogical research by um, members of the Jewish community. So um, we say, who is this man? It's, it's a bit like Nick Clegg. Is he Russian? Is he Dutch? Is he Brit British? We don't know what he is, uh, but um, he seems to be running a particularly corrupt government. Yes, and speaking of corruption, um, here we've got ex coroner uh, John Owen. He's from uh, Hlandello, Hlandethlo. How do you pronounce it? I do apologise to, to our Welsh viewers that, that I'm. Uh, <laughs> apologies for that. Uh, so he has uh, stole. He was um, has been put in prison for stealing money from a farmer, John Williams, uh, after being made a, a executor of his will. So basically, what was going on? He had a failing uh, law firm uh, and decided that he would uh, try to. Uh, pump a bit of life into it by um, stealing money from people who had recently passed away uh, and for whom he was uh, executor of their wills. Uh, and uh, so he's previously admitted 17 counts of theft and false accounting, uh, but he had been a pillar of the community. Is that, is that uh, something um, Freemasonic or something, being a pillar of the community? Is that what that means? Yeah, probably. Uh, so uh, he's deeply ashamed and, of course, uh, he is, has let down his uh, profession uh, in the legal profession. Uh, but other people that have let down their professions is a doctor, uh, Miles Bradbury, jailed for 22 years um, for uh, abusing 25 offences, including sexual assault, voyeurism, possessing more than 16,000 indecent images uh, on, on young boys. Um, so this is uh, another pretty disgusting uh, Presumably he's out on bail, is he? Uh, I think he has been. Yeah. Uh, but I think he's going to prison now at last. Uh, yeah, the judge I'm... told him his offences were gross and gr grotesque breach of trust, apparently. Uh, but right. it doesn't seem to matter how many breaches of trust of all types that we see, whether it be Stephen Dorrell, who is effectively uh, breaching his trust as an MP, to this type of uh, person who's breaching his trust uh, and taking advantage. Uh, this goes for for priests or, or ministers that are taking advantage, or teachers that are taking advantage of their, their situation, their mm. professional situation. Um, it doesn't matter how many breaches of trust. I, I'd li like to know what it's going to take for people to say, we're not prepared to take this anymore, and uh, this is unacceptable behaviour. Which is what we need people to do, of course. Yeah. Um, withdraw their consent and just say what you are and are not prepared to accept. I don't think I'm prepared to accept this man. Uh, well, uh, we do get to the uh, autumn statement, of course, which is coming up, and the media are now full of uh, the autumn statement. Uh, and uh, Osborne said about his autumn statement, our long-term economic plan means that today we can invest an unprecedented £15 billion into Britain's infrastructure to improve, repair and expand our roads. Our plans will transform some of the country's most important strategic uh, routes with ambitious projects to duel the A303, A1, A27 and A47, as well as spending on important local infrastructure, boosting productivity and helping local economies. Now, of course, uh, this announcement has now been made several times, uh, but he's making it once uh, over the last couple of years, but he's making it once again um, because uh, he, he must have been whatever he was on here. He's, he's still on or something. He's high. Yeah. 
Uh, look, hashtag Osborne must go because he really must. Uh, but in announcing this today, uh, he was, well, I, I'm not going to make any comment on the spe Spectator article itself other than to say, you know, you can understand why he needs a high visibility jacket there because somebody might push him into those trees and, and just forget about him otherwise. Or put him on the top of a tree. Well, possibly. Uh, but anyway, uh, of course, £15 billion for our roads, that's one thing. Uh, but the Liberal Democrats are pushing the £2 billion pound boost to the National Health Service because they're prioritising. Uh, they are prioritising the NHS. Uh, so uh, what they say here today, George Osborne is reportedly pledging £2 billion pounds for NHS spending. This follows call, calls from Norman Lamb uh, to make it an autumn statement priority. Well, clearly it hasn't quite done that. Now, Clegg uh, said that uh, this and the, the uh, money for new roads will rebalance the economy, but it has, to, uh, and he was saying that on, re on the Radio 4 Today programme this morning, but of course it's going to take more than a £2 billion pound increase in the NHS business to rebalance his mental health, I suspect. Mm. Mm. Magic mushrooms being mentioned in the chat right. box, you know. Okay. Well, well. anyway, let's just remember why we're investing £15 billion pounds, uh, in Britain's roads at this point when apparently we have no money. Uh, and that is because uh, in 2012, in March 2012, as reported by The Guardian here, uh, David Cameron was unveiling plans to sell off the roads. And of course, he can't sell off the roads uh, while they're in such a despicable state. So this, this is what they're Oh, well, doing. they're going to spend all the public money on the roads, getting it all in place. Exactly. This is what all the gan <coughs> excuse me, the gantries, the signs, the uh, road charging being installed in front of our face, and then when all the work's done at huge cost, then you hand it over to who? Who's made the offer? Rothschild, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes. Mr. Rothschild Amongst has said, others, "I'll, I'll yes. take over your roads." They're, they're saying they're going to have a, a sovereign, mm. a sovereign uh, fund for this, um, but basically, yes, they plan to sell it off to. The Rothschild or some other cartel. Yeah. Wonderful. Country dismantles in front of our eyes. People asset stripped. stripped. Asset stripped. People still allowing it. It needs to stop. Um, we'll just bring you back to 2013 uh, when we were saying on the front page, these people are the domestic terrorists. They are the cabal destroying Britain. And if that was a headline back from 2013, it's absolutely true now. We are just watching the Lib Lab Con uh, dismantle the country. And the key bit they're now going to go for, this is UK column prediction, you are going to see them go flat out uh, to try and remove any trace, any and all traces of our constitution mm. and certainly common law. And it hasn't escaped us that uh, Boris Johnson is apparently now saying, well, trust me to run the legal system in London. We'll have a look at that tomorrow. Uh, but um, it's not funny. Uh, somebody said to us a while ago, don't think that Boris Johnson is a buffoon. He's an extremely dangerous man. And here we have an extremely dangerous man wants to control the legal system in London. Um, separate city state, in your words, I think. Yes. Uh, Mike. Uh, well, it, we couldn't be more blunt at the beginning of uh, December 2014. 2015 is going to be a very important year. Obviously, the elections are a key part of it. Uh, we need a great many people uh, to be standing up and saying, not in our name. And uh, We really need to get rid of the existing 640-odd MPs. Uh, they need to go. There will be no um, restoration of this country while people of their ilk are still in Parliament. Uh, just think about George Osborne, and he must go. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, just a reminder before we go that uh, Ian Crane is not back in the country yet, so um, there'll be no Crane report or fracking nightmare tonight. Um, he will be back in time for next Monday, however, so we're back to live shows on Monday nights with Ian Crane. Yeah. Um, and uh, we uh, obviously are going to... We, we have a conference coming up in March, um, and... Alex G has a separate conference coming up in November 2015. He sent me all the details and asked me if I could mention it in today's program. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we ran out of time before I could get the details on a slide. So we'll, we'll make sure that that's in the program tomorrow. OK, um, just a last note. Uh, we'd like to say get well to Lee, who is uh, suffering in a very big way at the moment. Said I'd give you a mention. I've done it. And um, we're looking forward to... Um, 
Louise coming back tomorrow, mm -hmm. hopefully. So uh, it'll be good to get uh, Lou back in the studio with us. Thanks for joining us. Don't go into a black hole. Can we stop it? Yes. How do we do it? We need millions of people to withdraw their consent from the criminal activity in British Westminster. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.